The Jewish Channel's Week in Review. A prominent Jewish elected official is arrested, an Israeli staple heads to a New York food truck, synagogues in miniature, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Perhaps the most prominent Orthodox Jewish elected official in the United States was arrested last week. New York State Assemblyman Sheldon Silver faces charges of receiving bribes and kickbacks totaling an alleged $4 million. Silver has often been described as one of the several most powerful people in New York State politics, and his Orthodox Judaism has been a frequently commented on aspect of his character and connection to community. Silver's fall from grace is yet one more way in which the historic Jewish community of the Lower East Side, where Silver lives, is being reduced from what once was a very prominent place. Also facing potential charges these days is the State of Israel. The International Criminal Court has launched a, quote, preliminary examination into the situation in Palestine that appears targeted at the past six months or so of activity in the Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. That would include the entirety of the Gaza War, as well as numerous incidents of violence against or killing of Palestinians outside the immediate context of that war. A key word in that declaration is the word preliminary, as the goal of a preliminary examination in the court is only to determine whether probable cause cause exist to proceed with a full criminal investigation, as well as whether the court has jurisdiction. Also key is the use of the word Palestine to describe the Palestinian state recognized in 2012 by the United Nations General Assembly and other bodies. The United States, Israel, and a handful of other countries have continually voted against recognizing Palestine as a state. And that is the crux of the objection by the U.S. State Department to this investigation. A State Department spokesperson said in response to the court's announcement, quote, as we have said repeatedly, we do not believe that Palestine is a state, and therefore we do not believe that it is eligible to join the ICC. It is a tragic irony that Israel, which has withstood thousands of terrorist rockets fired at its civilians and its neighborhoods, is now being scrutinized by the ICC. But where Israel goes from here in so many respects will largely be determined by the Israeli elections to be held this March. And that's an election that is now the subject of international controversy with the United States. As Speaker of the House, John Boehner has invited Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to speak to Congress just two weeks before the election. The move is being widely criticized by Netanyahu's political opponents in Israel as an opportunistic grab on the eve of an election, and by many here in the U.S. for Congressional Republicans' choice to work around the White House and State Department and conduct foreign policy directly with Netanyahu. Meantime, many in the U.S. this week have been inundated with cold weather and snow. Hoping to warm up kosher consumers with an Israeli twist on street food is a new shakshuka truck, and Meredith Gansman stopped by to get a bite. It's lunchtime in Midtown Manhattan, and the options are endless. Pizza, Asian, falafel, and now a lesser-known Israeli import is parked and ready to serve. Get in line at the shuka truck, serving shakshuka. Shakshuka is two eggs poached in a tomato sauce that has roasted bell peppers inside, harissa, all kinds of spices. Everyone, everyone changes it differently. But serving from a truck? The idea was to bring something healthy, something good, something different. So we thought, what's the way to bring what we like, or what reminds us of home, bring it back to the city, to the streets, and what's the best way for three young guys to do it? Food truck, because it's the coolest thing ever, you know? Gabriel is the only trained chef. Having worked for famed French chef Daniel Balud, before opening the Shuka truck, Solomon and Josh worked in real estate. And now we have a truck, we're stuck in the truck, we live in the truck, you live in the truck. But these childhood friends have been eating shock Shuka their whole lives. And they have different opinions on who makes it best. Each one of us, yeah. I, can, I, can, I, can, I believe that it's our mother, it's our mother, it's our grandmother, you know, it's something in the army we used to do it. And the Shuka team believes their traditional egg dishes can compete in the lunchtime rush. The minute you eat a hamburger or you eat pizza, you can't continue your day. Like you have to go to sleep. <laughs> so you got room for like a sous chef to come learn how to make uh, shakshuka for the day? Yeah. Yeah. You can put me to work, we'll work for shakshuka. In a very hot pan, two eggs poach on top of a spiced tomato sauce for a couple of minutes. Cilantro, olive oil, lemon juice, feta, and charred onions top the eggs. And it's served with a toasted challah bread and za'atar spiced potato chips. For more on the Shuka truck, watch the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. 
Thank you, Meredith. The Jewish world often seems quite small, but Christian Neiden got a look at iconic Jewish synagogues literally in miniature. Here's his report. 1,500 years worth of Jewish religious architecture is making a rare appearance in one New York City space. Yeshiva University Museum has opened a new exhibition of 10 highly detailed miniature Jewish houses of worship titled Modeling the Synagogue from Dura to Turo, on now through July 5th. Originally commissioned by the museum to coincide with its founding in 1973, the models were the product of intense scholarly research and skillful artistic craftsmanship. Yeshiva University Museum Director Jacob Weiss described the breadth of miniature history on display. So you go from 3rd century Syria, from Dura Europis, to 19th century Florence, and it really encompasses the breadth of the Jewish world from the Middle East to America, and the breadth of synagogue architecture. You have, in some sense, 10 very distinct synagogue architectural styles, and yet also you get to experience uh, the common themes that course through these synagogues. That goes back to the earliest examples on display, like the 6th century Beit Alpha synagogue in the Jezreel Valley in Israel. And something that is especially surprising to modern day viewers is how much of the decorative program uh, was elaborated in these synagogues. The uh, elaborate mosaic uh, that existed on the floor of the Beit Alpha synagogue, which shows you an image of the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, images of the zodiac in the middle, and an elaborate uh, mosaic uh, of what was probably an image of what the Torah Ark itself looked like. That ancient practice of synagogue decorations echoing Jewish communal and religious traditions continued to the 17th century Spanish-Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. This is a synagogue that was founded mainly by conversos fleeing from, uh, from Spain and Portugal. And the synagogue, the space, the way that it's constructed from the orientation of the seats to the orientation of the bima, the reader's platform, in relationship to the rest of the synagogue, the position of the president, the Parnasses seat in the synagogue, are all things that continue and that establish a model for other Sephardi congregations uh, to the Newport uh, Synagogue in America in the 18th century. To see more of the 10 buildings on display as part of modeling the synagogue from Dura to Turo on now at Yeshiva University through July 5th, Please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Finally, this week on Up Close, finding empathy with those who've suffered from violence can be a task for individuals and for entire communities. This April marks the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, an act that's still not recognized as such by Congress, the White House, Israel, or many Jewish organizations. But the parallels between the Armenian-American experience and the Jewish-American experience are quite strong, from summer camp to questions of how to deal with a legacy of being victimized by collective violence. Melina Tumani discusses her memoir, There Was and There Was Not. And for Bergen Record columnist Mike Kelly, coming to understand the legacy of terrorist violence led him to examine the lives of two young American Jews killed 20 years ago in a bus bombing in Jerusalem. We discuss his book, The Bus on Jaffa Road. Here are some of the highlights from my interview with Mike Kelly. So you cover northern New Jersey, and one story that you probably didn't expect to be following you throughout your career was a story of terrorism in Jerusalem. Right. But, but surprisingly, uh, it has kind of been this, this threat in your career. Sure, certainly since 9-11. I mean, uh, I, like many of us, who, who were working that day, we had no idea what we were entering into when we heard that two planes had just crashed into the World Trade Center. But as I look back on my career, I have written here and there about terrorism, not knowing what the full implications were. But 9-11 was very much a turning point for me, and that's when I, I started to cover terrorism in a, in a much more substantial way still having no idea that it would lead me to Jaffa Road in downtown Jerusalem. But you'd already in 1996 been covering this episode where uh, a northern New Jersey uh, woman uh, and her boyfriend of, of several years mm -hmm. were, uh, were killed in a bus bombing in Jerusalem. That's right. Yeah. Uh, when Sarah Duker was killed, um, she is from Teaneck, New Jersey, a, a local woman, uh, and we, we immediately jumped on the story, as any good local newspaper would. 
I remember going to her house that day, uh, or soon, a soon after she was killed, and I wrote a column about it, uh, basically focusing on the irony. Sarah had written some essays uh, that basically spoke to her sympathy toward the Palestinians and how much she would like to see the Pal Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolved. And I thought, how ironic, you know, here was a young woman who had who had some empathy for the Palestinian cause, and yet here she was killed by the most radical elements of that cause. And some of the people you speak to, you speak to the, I guess, terrorist mastermind sure. is, is the word that would be used uh, behind this bombing and, and a number of other terrorist acts, and asked him why. I had always been under the assumption when suicide bombings took place that they were the work of perhaps one deranged individual and how wrong I was. I, I ended up getting a report by the United States State Department on this particular bombing and it showed a number of Palestinian suspects, one of whom was in jail. His name was Hassan Salome. So I called up the Israelis and I said, could I interview this guy? And after much back and forth, they said yes. The book begins with this interview uh, where I ask him, do you know the name Sarah Duker? And oddly enough, he said yes, in perfect English. And then I said, simply, why did you kill her? You can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable. You can also listen to the full audio of Up Close as a podcast, available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on TV. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.